Of all the confusing parts of my childhood, nothing rivals my excitement for Epic Mickey. I kept up with all the concept art and official updates. When it came out, I even got the collector's edition with the skins for my Wii and the vinyl figure. And yet, although I've finished playthroughs intermittently over the past decade, the game has become an enigma to me. As I approached the game again recently, I didn't know what I would think. While it was in development, it was shaping itself up to be a pretty big deal attaching Deus Ex director Warren Spector, and promising a platformer that borrowed its DNA from immersive sims. Yeah, a platformer that encourages player choice and consequence. That's a pretty cool idea that surprisingly hasn't been experimented with yet. And who else to do it but Warren Spector, the man who pioneered the genre? In the medium of animation, it was also a landmark game for resurrecting Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, the precursor to Mickey Mouse. In case you didn't know, legal issues have plagued the character's return, ever since the rights were claimed by Charles Mintz of Universal Studios in 1928. It would be 75 years before an attempt was made to reclaim the character, as in 2003, Disney Interactive pitched an Oswald video game to Disney's president at the time. And then, something incredible happened. The stars aligned for this monumental occasion. Three years later, Disney traded ABC sportscaster Al Michaels for the rights to Oswald. That's right, they traded a human being for a cartoon character. But this would get the ball rolling for Epic Mickey, a game that focused heavily on the feeling of abandonment Oswald felt over the past eight decades. The game's tone was exceptionally unique, and that, combined with the prospect of compelling game design based on its mixture of platforming and immersive sim, was enough to bring Epic Mickey into the limelight. So then, after all this build-up, why was it released to relatively lukewarm reviews? Well, nearly a decade later, I've decided to revisit this curious part of my childhood. Did all of this hubbub that led to the game's creation pay off, or did it deserve to be forgotten like Oswald once was? I'm eager to find out for myself. I'm Liam Triforce, and this is Epic Mickey. If I could repeat myself, Epic Mickey's tone and concept were immediately what drew me in. I mean, let's think about this for a second. You have obscure and forgotten Disney media and characters that inhabit a wasteland created to live in the shadow of the real Disney theme parks. To me, this is Epic Mickey's defining quality. Its presentation is outstanding in every regard, and its existence as a Wii exclusive meant that Junction Point's art team could take full advantage of the hardware, rather than having to design around it. The team never missed an opportunity to respect and adapt the source material into a truly immersive take on Disney's properties and theme parks. I haven't really talked about this much, but I love theme parks. I love virtually enveloping myself in a world created by developers, but constructing something like that in reality and telling a story with it is not only impressive, it's magical, if you'd excuse the corniness. But I think it's true, and Epic Mickey's unique take on the worlds of Disney is wonderfully compelling. Here are but a few examples of why that is. The game's hub world is known as Mean Street. Yeah, get it? It's a central gathering place for forgotten tunes. Much like the rest of the world, it has been torn apart by the Thinner Disaster, thus accentuating the contrast between what was once a thriving haven for these characters and the disaster that plagued them. Here's a detail I love. You know those walls you can find in various Disney parks that simulate depth, as if the park is much bigger and there's more to explore? Those walls can be found in Mean Street, but the contrast between those colorful walls and the damage the Thinner caused is pretty poignant. It represents what Mean Street once was quite well. Other areas like Oztown and Ventureland exist to represent mechanical, almost steampunk-esque versions of their real-life counterparts. This representation is handled with such grace, and it makes for some of the most beautiful levels I've ever had the pleasure of visiting in a platformer. This kind of care goes into every level and cutscene of Epic Mickey to make it feel like a trip through a dilapidated Disneyland. But it takes advantage of its medium and its source material. For example, my absolute favorite level in the game is Mickey Junk Mountain a level made up entirely of forgotten and obscure Mickey Mouse media. A lot of it is real memorabilia and merchandise. Even some of the Mickey Mouse video games can be found lying on the ground. And the level in the projector that parallels climbing the mountain happens to be a cartoon about climbing a mountain, alpine climbers. Speaking of these projector levels, these things are an absolute treat to go through. They hit the various story beats and memorable moments of the cartoons through set pieces and level design. Let's take a look at Plutopia as an example. The opening door, the machete in the log, and even punishing the cat are all implemented as features and hazards when platforming. Indeed, Epic Mickey's aesthetical brilliance doesn't stop at fidelity. It ties directly into why interacting with the world is fun. 
Gremlin Village takes you through a barely operational version of It's a Small World that has been completely drowned in thinner, with each part of the world getting its own thematic representation. My favorite being the Asia portion. It's because you're climbing temples and eventually you can fix up a dragon that'll take you to the exit. Interacting with these levels is really fun most of the time. And with each level comes great music. The soundtrack, composed by Jim Dooley, complements the atmosphere of each area and your actions throughout the game. For example, Oztown has a sad melody to represent what the town once was. And if you decide to primarily focus on painting the world, the music gets happier. But if you decide to primarily use thinner, well, Take a listen. Melody's absence and the heavy focus on long, disturbing drones, you are forced to face the consequences of your actions. The atmosphere in every level in the game will change like this to reflect how you play. Jim Dooley breathed an equal amount of life into the game as the art team, using his clever and dynamic compositions. <laughs> So yeah, Epic Mickey's presentation is great, and the way the world presents itself is intriguing. But how does it complement your actions? Well, the primary mechanic of Epic Mickey is the brush. It allows you to paint in or thin out certain elements of the world, emblematic of the duality present in the game's core conceit. Epic Mickey's gameplay is at its best when you're exploring levels and interacting with the world through painting and thinning. Examples of this range from thinning out portions of buildings to find what you're looking for, painting and thinning various platforms to traverse the world, knocking over debris with thinner, or creating a new path with paint. The interactivity present allows problems to be solved in different ways. The Wii Remote also lends itself well to using the brush effectively, thanks to its pointer functionality. It feels so natural to just point at what you want to paint or thin. Apparently, Epic Mickey was originally going to be released for PS3 and Xbox 360, with a Wii port being handled outside of Junction Point. But the Wii's controls led them to solely develop for the console, and it paid off. This all makes the brush fun to use, and it makes the platforming in the game meaningful and exciting most of the time. As the game approaches the climax, I found myself having to paint in platforms quickly as I was making jumps. I was making split-second decisions that made me feel like a badass in the moment. The brush makes platforming and puzzle solving dynamic and unique, and I feel like it'll always be Epic Mickey's claim to fame. It's not without its problems, though. Most infamously, the camera can get stuck on obstacles frequently, and it's quite awkward managing it while attempting to use the brush, and especially when trying to platform. The camera controls are placed above the jump button, and you need to hop your thumb up to the d-pad to use them, thus preventing you from jumping until it's oriented properly. This is part of what makes the final level unbearable. Because the camera was at such a poor angle in corridors, I was getting blindsided by blotticles and I'd fall to my death over and over again. In addition to this, while combat with the brush is interesting as you have the choice of making enemies fight for you or fall before you, and different scenarios fueled my decision making there, whether you're painting or thinning enemies, defeating blotlings can take an absurd amount of time. Sometimes hitting them off of platforms or taking the ground out from underneath them are solid options but most of the time the game forces you to dump a steady stream at them until they finally give up. There's also a lack of invincibility frames, meaning that if you get stunned, you can get hit again during that period. Pair that with knockback, and you have two of the worst things you can overlook in a 3D platformer. Although, perhaps what is most criminal is that you don't need to bother with most enemies in Epic Mickey. Sometimes the game will force you to fight, but otherwise you can walk straight past them. This goes for tougher enemies as well. This thick boy right here is meant to be snuck past, because if you make too much noise around him, he'll explode. However, if you straight up run past him, he'll either explode behind you or he won't even detonate because you're too far away at that point, thus defeating the purpose of the enemy. 
Most enemies in Epic Mickey don't serve much of a purpose both as an obstacle or as a method of attracting guardians. So guardians are an attempt at encouraging players to manage their decision making. But the end result ends up being confused. Essentially, if you paint or thin a certain amount of things in the world, you'll eventually attract a guardian based on your actions. They'll kill most enemies in one hit and they'll show you where you need to go next. But every time you use a guardian, it'll disappear. For your meter to fill up, you need to consistently perform certain actions, something that isn't easy when the game highly encourages you to perform the opposite actions to deal with certain situations, thus draining your meter. It doesn't render the system unusable, however. What really kills its practical application is the fact that enemies are useless, and it isn't terribly difficult to find your way around levels. It'd make more sense if guardians could be used to help you find nearby treasure, because the primary objective is usually quite clear. So all in all, the guardians aren't an effective way to introduce a morale system into the game. But that's fine, because the game goes out of its way to both reward and punish you in impactful ways depending on your actions. <laughs> I'm kidding. It doesn't. In fact, Epic Mickey has barely any incentive for you to do anything aside from finishing it. This is for a few reasons, but let's start with the most relevant one. Consequence in Epic Mickey is often negligible. This is noticeable early on, as Gremlin Tiesto asks you to patch the steam pipes. If you do, he'll grant you access to some concept art in the extras menu. If you don't, you'll have to avoid some extra steam heading to the next area. You could say that this was just a test, but I'd argue that choosing between the life of a gremlin and some e-tickets early on was a better test of morality. Since e-tickets are your currency, they're immediately more useful to you. But there's a life at stake. It's nothing too crazy. If you save him, all he gives you is a useless collectible. By the way, we'll talk about those soon. But it is an amusing way to present the concept of morality to you. With the steam pipes, it doesn't matter. You'll be past that decision before you have time to process what you even did. But fine, you could consider this yet another extension of that initial choice you had to make with the gremlin and the e-tickets. However, if that is the case, how do you explain the lack of consequence that persists until the credits roll? It feels like nothing I do in this game matters. As you repair the clock here, you have the option to fill it with either paint or thinner. Out of curiosity, I decided to fill it with thinner. Now, instead of the gate staying open, the gate will go a little funky and you gotta be careful! Are you kidding me? In Oz Town, I could painstakingly activate the phone network, or pay Prescott to beat the shit out of the phone inside the house. One choice gets me a power spark that I can put towards restoring projectors. The other choice does nothing. Nothing at all. I can pay my way out of this quest with no consequence. Or how about this? I could paint Moody's house over here for some e-tickets, or I could drop a safe on him and kill him. One gives me e-tickets, the other choice gives me the satisfaction of murdering a pirate. But both rewards basically mean nothing to the overall structure of the game. Oh, but this is all early game, Liam! Truly, the consequences are more dire as you progress. <laughs> no, of course not. Way later in the game, in Bog Easy, you have the choice between scaring Lewis or giving him his Courage Medal. If you want an easy 200 e-tickets, you can sell the medal to the ghost that scares him and it'll open the gate immediately. For the good path, you'll have to both restore his courage and another village's courage. While this path does allow you to unlock further quests, it takes more work. And that work can make the following levels take longer than they should. Meanwhile, there's an easy 200 e-tickets, and you don't even have to think about further quests. On Skull Island, if you fill Hook's machine with thinner, the island is supposedly more dangerous, although I never noticed a difference. If you fill it with paint, you get a pin. I know that these are both lackluster outcomes, but again, by the time you're thinking about whatever consequence could be present, you've already left for the next level and you never have to think about it again. You could say that making the decision to kill Moody over painting his house makes me a bad person, but the game never reprimands me for this. I never felt a difference. A completely cosmetic change to the game and a shift in atmosphere is not enough to change the game at its core. And we're talking about Warren Spector here. This is the man that created Deus Ex, a game that shifts entirely depending on your choices. Indeed, the worst part about all of these quests is the fact that they don't provide you with lasting effects as the game progresses. All of these problems are in the moment, and almost never contribute anything to the overall playthrough, other than filling up a portion of your Guardian meter, which we've already established isn't a very good mechanic. So, let's take a look at Dishonored, a game that released just two years later to see how Epic Mickey could have implemented player consequence as a game with a morality system should. 
In Dishonored, your choices build consequence as you progress. And consequence is created in the moment based on what you think would be an effective way to deal with the situation. Let me explain. You have multiple ways to deal with this wall of light. You could find a way to climb over it or take out the guards patrolling around it. If you choose to deal with the guards, you have the option to render them unconscious or kill them. Strangling the guards takes a long time and can be slow and cumbersome. It puts you at risk of being caught while you choke them out. It also takes a longer time to get through levels that way. However, if you successfully take a non-lethal approach to clearing levels, your creativity and resourcefulness will reward you. You can seek out helpers that provide you with alternative ways to deal with your targets. On the flip side, killing enemies is quick and easy but the bodies will be discovered. Your name will quickly have a terrible reputation attached to it. Rats will fill the streets as they devour the corpses of your victims. People that aren't happy with your merciless killings will refuse to help you and sometimes they'll even betray you. The plague will spread and the amount of victims filling the streets will only go up. And when you combine that with the rats, it makes it increasingly difficult to make your way around levels. It's totally fine if you want to play this way, and the game even makes it fun to disregard stealth completely, as long as you use your abilities and weapons creatively. You could completely ignore the notion that you should be a good person and kill everyone. The game's level design is exceptionally varied, and it allows for a wide array of outcomes. At one point I was going through the non-lethal route, but because it required continued resourcefulness, I eventually snapped and started killing my enemies. This caused my chaos to go up, and it took me a while to work it back down, but I eventually did because I decided to change my actions. It took a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun to do. In contrast to all of this, not only are Epic Mickey's consequence in the moment negligible, but I don't think the game cares about them either. Epic Mickey's lasting consequences don't exist. The game only attempts to justify your choices in the ending montage by showing you what you could have done or what you did do. But then, it immediately takes a U-turn and shows Mickey and Oswald being friends. This game could have creatively worked around the established character traits we've seen before, and the premise at first gives you breathing room to work that out. Maybe Mickey doesn't want to restore this world he's found himself in. Maybe he would rather let sleeping dogs lie and wipe out parts of Disney's history that they've left forgotten for a reason. I'd like to say that the concept persists, but the game doesn't let you make that decision. Mickey was the one that accidentally caused the thinner disaster, and he later apologized to Oswald for his mistake. Oswald learns to accept Mickey after he proves himself as a friend and ally. Yeah, if you were on the thinner path, proving yourself meant being a complete douche up to that point. So that scene contradicts literally everything you've done. I did it! I saved Wasteland, Oswald! Brothers. I ruined everything you built and took away everything you loved. Brothers. Do you see what I'm talking about? This creates a prime example of... And forgive me for using this term. Ludonarrative dissonance. Yes, I did just make a comparison to Dishonored, and then use the term ludonarrative dissonance in a video about Mickey Mouse. Are you mad? Because I'm mad at myself. It's true though. Why bother implementing ways to fuck with the game's characters and world if it all means nothing in the context of the narrative? Need I remind you, this game was directed by Warren Spector, a man that has been consistently credited with pioneering immersive sims. His magnum opus Deus Ex is a better example of implementing consequence into a video game, and that game came out a decade before Epic Mickey. Levels allow for a wide assortment of methods for dealing with enemies and clearing objectives. Major characters respond differently depending on how you deal with situations, and in turn, much like Dishonored, you could play the game based on what you think would be best. I only talked about Dishonored because I knew it better than Deus Ex, but I can easily say that Deus Ex does a better job than Epic Mickey. I'm not saying that Epic Mickey should have adopted the same gameplay systems as Dishonored or Deus Ex, that's ridiculous. But I do think Epic Mickey should have drastically revamped its consequences and narrative to create a more meaningful choice-driven experience. For example, the only upgrades you can obtain for your primary abilities are paint and thinner capacity upgrades, and you gain them depending on how you deal with bosses. This might sound cool, but your choices barely change how the fights play out. The only great example of player choice in these fights that I can think of is the fight with Captain Hook. You can either make him walk the plank, kill him, or allow Pete Pan to fight him by platforming your way to the sprite. This is interesting, but it's a shame that the boss isn't too difficult to complete. Other than that, not much to write home about. The clock tower takes a little longer with paint because you have to keep both of his arms painted at once to move on to the next phase. Petronic is the same way, just fill him up with whatever you want to upgrade. Even the final boss is like this, and it's probably one of the worst in the game due to how long it takes for him to be vulnerable. The bosses are the only things that affect gameplay in a meaningful way, and they're not even handled very well. 
Everything else involves atmospheric changes. Why not encourage the player to experiment with both sides and see which one they like best? They could have done this by implementing useful abilities that you'd gain if you stuck with either paint or thinner. You could experiment with such abilities and see the advantages and disadvantages of sticking with either side. Much like, oh, I don't know. Another game that Warren Spector directed? It would take a more creative person than me to flesh this concept out, but as it stands, there isn't much of an incentive to stick with either side other than aesthetical changes. And these aesthetics are inconsequential to the gameplay. That's Epic Mickey's big problem. So you might be thinking, okay, even though the game's core philosophy has failed spectacularly, there's gotta be a decent platformer in here anyway, right? Well, I have at least mentioned what this game does right in that department with the brush and whatnot, but those kinds of wonderful ideas are spread thin. Instead, Epic Mickey is filled to the brim with mundanity. From the beginning, the tutorial over-explains everything. Gus has to talk to you about every minute detail, and halt your progression to explain how guardians and enemies work. It goes on for far too long. And the quests boil down to, fetch me these things, Mickey. I don't care if you have to backtrack until you're bored out of your mind through the same projectors over and over again, just do it. Look for these, Mickey. Find this person. Find my parts, Mickey. Go talk to this person. Now go talk to this person. It never ends. And what's worse is that they aren't difficult. They're just really boring. This late in the game, I should not be playing Simon Says in order to make my trip through this part of the level more bearable. This is not a test of anything I've learned. This isn't about weighing my options. It's just mind-numbing. As I've touched upon before, most of these quests can be avoided, but some of them deliberately force you to backtrack. For example, this big tub of fuck needs you to make his true love notice him. Finding the flower he's asking for means trekking through projectors you've already visited. Meanwhile, you could sabotage the relationship by simply buying him ice cream. Because that's not what his true love likes. She's sick of ice cream because everybody gives her ice cream. Yeah, it's the morally corrupt thing to do to sabotage this relationship, but it cuts out the bullshit. Speaking of that, the game constantly gives you easy outs with boring quests like these. For example, the phone network quest I mentioned earlier where I can pay Prescott to skip setting up the network entirely. You might think that that'd be a waste of e-tickets, but dude, you get so many e-tickets in this game from smashing debris alone. Projector levels practically give them to you. You can find more valuable tickets if you explore. I can spend my e-tickets however I like if it makes my experience more bearable. Repetition is the name of the game for the final portion of Epic Mickey as well, exemplifying what I hate about recycling elements in a video game. The amount of blotticles you have to slowly work your way through is inexcusable. They never stop. They even force you to go through projectors you've already visited. There's padding at the very end of the game. It's very discouraging. Is this Epic Mickey's idea of challenge? If something takes long enough, does that mean it's hard? And you have to fight the same boss three times over, a boss that wasn't even interesting to begin with. Player choice is once again not present, with the poor exception of the museum here. Because it doesn't matter how you decide to clear it, both the happy and sad paintings lead you to the same result. And what's ironic is that you don't use thinner to reveal the sad paintings. You still have to paint them. So you're utilizing the good tool to do a bad thing. Whatever, I've gone on at length about how consequence means nothing to this game. Speaking of progression and incentive though, how about we talk about the things you're collecting? Well, what if I told you almost nothing you collect in this game matters? Yeah, it parallels the meaninglessness of your choices when playing this game. This is a pin. Pins can be fun to discover, but they don't exist for any purpose other than bragging rights. This isn't Super Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie. Collectibles aren't meant to be an integral part of progression in this game. Progression in Epic Mickey simply means reaching the end of a level by any means necessary. But outside of pins not being necessary for progression, why don't they contribute towards something else? Why aren't they a currency? Why don't they let you upgrade? Why bother here if there's no incentive? It's not like you can 100% this game on a single run-through. You'll need to do at least two playthroughs to collect every single pin, altering your choices each time. Pins are such a waste of potential. The other primary collectibles are power sparks. Now I mentioned these earlier, and they are actually used for progression. You'll need a set number of these to open the next projector. These can be found by exploring and completing specific quests. When your options are limited in the beginning, you are forced to complete mundane fetch quests on Mean Street in order to gain the power sparks you need. But even when the game gives you more freedom to collect them however you like, I began to realize just how unbalanced power sparks are as a reward system. Because in addition to all this, you can also buy power sparks from the Emporium. 
They attempt to balance this by increasing the price of a power spark every time you buy one, but as I've touched upon before, e-tickets are found everywhere and I only spend them on bribes so I can get through the game faster. Because really, the only other way you can spend e-tickets that matters is by upgrading your health. But I'd argue the game is easy enough that you'd never have to do that. You can also find power sparks lying around corners sometimes. So, buying them from the store and finding them randomly lying on the ground make them really easy to rack up. Then you can grab whatever others you find during your adventure and you'll never have to worry about doing bad fetch quests again. On the flip side, I decided to collect all of Daisy's missing parts while adventuring. After finally tracking them all down, you know what I got? A power spark. So yes, this means all of the effort led me to something that I could have gotten by either spending a few e-tickets or turning a fucking corner. This got me just a little angry, and simultaneously very curious as to what I would be rewarded with had I collected all of Goofy or Donald's parts. And guess what? You don't even get a power spark! You get e-tickets. E-tickets that you can find anywhere, and can even be given if you meet certain criteria in levels. The worst part is that you can't re-enter most levels afterwards, so if you miss certain parts, the only way you can obtain them otherwise is by purchasing each individual part for 1,000 e-tickets. So imagine saving up for the part you missed in order to complete the quest, and hope for a great reward after how long the quest took, only to purchase it and be rewarded with about a tenth of the amount you paid for the part. Actually, there's a possibility that you could have spent up to 4,000 e-tickets, assuming that you wanted to buy every single part to complete the quest. You could be spending 4,000 e-tickets only to earn about 2.5% of what you paid. This is abysmal. Epic Mickey feels like it's fighting back against my curiosity at every turn. Which is ironic considering curiosity was such an integral part of Mickey's identity during the cartoons this game pulls inspiration from. Even when you're given a few e-tickets as a reward, it's still much less of a slap in the face when compared to getting a pin as a reward. At least you can use e-tickets. Pins just sit there in the menu, burning a hole in your television. The only collectible I can really say contributed anything to progression were the film reels. Ironically, these film reels come from levels where Epic Mickey is completely stripped of its gameplay identity, and yet they're the most tightly designed parts of the game. It is always a treat to visit these levels and figure out how to nab those tricky film reels. You know, as long as you're only going through them once. The Usher rewards you with e-tickets, power sparks, and even health upgrades on occasion. It's the most consistent way to obtain all of these things because it doesn't take very long to track down the film reels. And they're actually fun to find. The one thing I do wish you got out of collecting them was the ability to view the cartoons the levels are based on. Huge missed opportunity. It is an incredible bonus to have a hard-to-find Oswald cartoon and one of my favorite Mickey cartoons on the disc but it'd be amazing to unlock the cartoons the levels are based on after finding each corresponding film reel. Anyway, I guess it's always nice to end rather negative evaluations of something on a positive note, right? Because I really enjoy certain aspects of Epic Mickey, but those aspects are drowned by missed potential and questionable design choices. Imagine how this game could have handled collectibles. Once again, what if pins contributed towards an upgrade system that allowed you to unlock new abilities for your paint or thinner, depending on your choices? And how about this? In the context of the narrative, what if Oswald wasn't present or mentioned until the very end of the game? As if the Mad Doctor brainwashed everyone into believing he created Wasteland. And you, as Mickey, don't know anything about this. Your choices would be entirely based on contextual clues from the world around you. And upon meeting Oswald, he would tell you the truth and either congratulate you on restoring his world, or criticize you for destroying it. Then, you'd either work together to stop the Shadow Blot, or you'd take down Oswald. And maybe even then, there'd be a neutral ending if you decided to befriend Oswald at the last second using paint in his boss fight. I mean, I'm just spitballing at this point, but I guess I just really wanted Epic Mickey to fulfill its intended purpose. And I don't think it did. But what about Epic Mickey 2? After the first game's reception, Junction Point now had an opportunity to fix their missteps. One of the primary things War Inspector focused on was addressing complaints about the camera. He said that the team has made over 1,000 specific changes to the camera. That's some crazy overcompensation there, bud. Oh, also, the camera wasn't the only problem with Epic Mickey. What about objectives? What about collectibles? What about legitimate consequence for your actions? What about any incentive at all? Nope. It's got co-op, 
it's a musical, and we really tried to fix that one problem, guys. Revisiting this game with my new perspective on the original had me extremely anxious for one soul-crushing reason. I knew it fixed none of these things. While I did take nearly a decade to formulate an opinion on Epic Mickey, when its sequel launched back in 2012, I knew what I thought of it the moment I saw the credits roll. Epic Mickey 2 is not a good game. First off, Epic Mickey 2 was released on multiple platforms, seeing as the Wii was at the end of its life and the Wii U was about to take over. Of course, that console's reign was very short-lived, but it sure did try. The multi-platform release unfortunately meant spending development resources on optimization for Wii, Wii U, PS3, Xbox 360, PC, and even the PlayStation Vita, and I can't really say it paid off. From what I remember, the Wii version is probably the most comfortable version of the game. It obviously looked a little worse than its HD counterparts, but you still had that wonderful Wii remote to control your brush. The PS3 version let you use PlayStation Move controls, so you get the best of both worlds there. HD graphics and superior controls. Although I doubt most of you have a PlayStation Eye for your PS3 in 2019, let alone a PlayStation Move controller. And a... and a... the, the analog stick thing. Yeah, the, you're, you're not going to be using those controls, are you? I mean, if you have them, then get that version, but did really, did most people even buy these? In addition, the PS3 version suffers from frame rate drops at times, same goes for the Xbox. And when talking of frame rate problems, I would suggest you do not buy this game on Wii U. If you enter an area where you think it might chug, it'll chug. It chugs like a big old choo-choo train, and it's borderline unplayable in co-op. My little cousin got that game for Christmas one year, and I asked her what she thought of it, and she said it was hard to play because it was running in slow motion most of the time. You know, when a 7 year old notices that your game runs like shit, you should probably fix it. The Wii U version was how I initially experienced Epic Mickey 2, and needless to say it hindered any enjoyment I could have pulled from the game. And to top it all off, the PC version suffered from technical issues when it launched, and allegedly, some issues still linger. I can't speak to the accuracy of those claims, my game only crashed once while recording footage for this video, but I'm willing to believe them. I feel like each team that worked on porting this game across several platforms spread themselves too thin, and the game suffered as a result. And that would put into perspective all of the other miscellaneous technical issues with Epic Mickey 2. The game is janky as hell. Among numerous bugs and hiccups like skipping a phase through death in this boss here, the camera is still a major issue. It'll still get stuck on walls and doors and objects. It's angled poorly in certain situations and can result in frustration when platforming. I know they must have tried to fix the camera, but I definitely don't think they met their goal of not having to touch the manual camera controls. Also, when you're not playing with some poor soul next to you, you'll have to rely on Oswald's artificial intelligence. And with an already unfinished game, you can imagine how well Oswald actually works on his own. There are many times where I'll just be waiting for his shit-brained AI to reorient itself. It can make a lot of the cooperative actions in the game infuriating. When Oswald decides to work, it's fine. But when he attempts to achieve sentience and break free of the game's miserable programming... Yeah. And on top of that, the PC version doesn't even have an option for co-op. The game's primary selling point has been ripped out of it. You are forced to deal with this AI if you decide to play the game on PC. When talking about co-op, a lot of the actions they have you performing in this game as a duo are arbitrary, and only exist to create the illusion of mechanical depth. Co-op adds almost nothing to Epic Mickey 2. The most they have you do is pull switches together. Combat can be creative, like with this enemy that Oswald has to stun, allowing you to defeat it once the blot pops out. But other than that, you could remove Oswald from the game and you wouldn't even notice it focuses on co-op. I've played a plethora of bad licensed co-op games in my day, but Epic Mickey 2 wins the award for most arbitrary inclusion of co-op in a platformer. Oswald contributes barely anything meaningful outside of when the game forces you to perform mundane actions. There isn't much unique puzzle solving to be done and there aren't very many enemies that utilize the concept of co-op creatively. It's a huge waste of development resources, when they could have refined what actually needed fixing in the first game. But why don't we talk about that though? Aside from Wii and PS3, all platforms force you to use the right analog stick or the mouse to control both the camera and the brush at the same time. Not even the Wii U lets you use the Wii Remote. Granted, the game allows you to switch between two methods of aiming, either use the reticle to turn the camera or let the camera's center be a reticle. The former is how I used the brush and I didn't have that many problems, although I did miss using the Wii Remote. You can't top that accuracy. The lack of pointer controls were a gripe for many people, but if I could get around them, I'm willing to bet other people could too. 
Once again, Epic Mickey 2's strength is exploration and interacting with levels using the brush. It makes for unique puzzle solving scenarios that I can't get enough of, as you have to thin out half of the balls here and subsequently paint the remaining half in order to progress. And there are even some levels in between bigger areas that play like projector levels, although you have access to your paint and thinner here. They're structured like Metroidvanias and allow you to explore for collectibles non-linearly. The more I see creativity like this, the more I wish Epic Mickey was a linear 3D platformer that solely focused on ideas like this, rather than implementing the DNA of an immersive sim rather sloppily. Speaking of that, no. Epic Mickey 2 does not improve upon those things, and they bog down the experience. And I noticed that would be the case as soon as I was able to explore Mean Street. Here's a real juicy example. I saved a gremlin while underground and he offered to clear a path for a small fee later on. When I declined, he was like, Oh, good luck doing it yourself then, mate. However, the fireworks I needed to get through the path are right next to it. Literally right next to it. There was no reason to save him at all. This is one of the worst examples of reward or consequence I've seen in this series. You could just walk by him and not save him and nothing would change. If you decide to break into the back of the Mad Hatter early by busting the generator, he'll double the price of costumes in his shop. While that may seem like a good punishment, costumes are entirely cosmetic, therefore defeating the purpose of the consequence. It would have been better if he charged you e-tickets. It would have been better if e-tickets weren't super easy to find. E-tickets, by the way, are even easier to find in this game. Valuable e-tickets pop up constantly while smashing debris, and it makes it insanely easy to get rich quick. So it's not a big deal when people charge you tickets, because you'll get them back a few minutes later. It's funny too, because breaking in actually benefits you more. You'll get a silver pin this way. Pins are currency in this game, by the way, so finding a lot of them whenever you can is encouraged. I don't want to wait, I want the pin early. You might think that having pins as currency would be an exciting way to improve upon their uselessness, because I mentioned that it would be a great idea. Unfortunately, I'm unhappy to report that looking for them is the only reward you're gonna get out of all of this. Just like the first game. The only thing you can work towards with pins are spirits. What I hoped these things did is unlock special abilities that enhance combat or puzzle solving, but all they really do is increase your paint or thinner capacity, and upgrade Oswald's targeting range. Of all the wasted opportunities I've seen in this series, this one is absolutely the worst because it would have been the easiest to fix. I couldn't believe that this was all I could gain with pins. And they take a lot of effort to unlock too, some of them requiring up to six pins I think. A lot of exploring and farming for pins that can slow the game down. Even though the paint and thinner regens stack, it's still not worth it due to the amount of pins you have to find. I like exploring for pins, but when my reward is either negligible or non-existent, why bother? What Epic Mickey 2 devolves into thanks to its arbitrary co-op actions and returning lack of incentive is a completely mind-numbing experience that only rarely exemplifies what it could have been. Why should I bother with these simplistic and mundane puzzles in Disney Gulch? Oh, because they get you a pin that works towards a lame reward. So just take the thinner path if you're bored. You'll get less out of the game, but at least it'll go by faster. I hate that I've gotten into this routine of taking the thinner path because doing the right thing bores me. It's kind of poetic, actually. The mundanity of the good path versus being selfish on the bad path. It's a metaphor for life, isn't it? Okay, I really need to calm down. <laughs> I understand that this series has its fans, and if you can get past its missed potential and the lack of incentive for most of your decision making, I suppose Epic Mickey 1 and 2 can both be completely serviceable platformers. But serviceable is not what they were meant to be. Epic Mickey wasn't going to be your average licensed platformer. It wasn't even going to be a pleasant surprise like Spongebob Battle for Bikini Bottom. From the beginning, Warren Spector wanted the game to be a dynamic adventure through a dark take on Disney's worlds. He wanted player choice and consequence to be an integral theme. I went on at length about the presentation in this series for a reason. It's because the presentation feels like a remnant of what the game wanted to be. For one, the music and atmosphere changes to represent the consequences of your actions far more than the actual gameplay does. And conceptually, what's left of the world after the thinner disaster is a call to either revive the world or call upon your own human curiosity and thin it away. It's symbolic of a development philosophy the team wanted to reach at one point. But in the final game, you can't chase those inherent motivations because every path leads to a dead end. Dead end here, dead end there. It's all either aesthetic, dies out early on, has a lack of consequence, or favors one path more than the other. 
I can't say for certain if Disney wanted Junction Point to cut back on the game's tone, but something severely hampered Epic Mickey's potential. And with the closure of Junction Point in 2013, followed by the announcement of Disney pursuing other ventures in the gaming industry, and finally the closure of Disney Interactive in 2016, it's safe to say we'll never see that potential be realized. Fans of Mickey Mouse should look towards Castle of Illusion, both the original and the remake, for a pair of excellent Mickey Mouse platformers. As for fans of immersive sims and games with player choice and consequence, stick to Deus Ex, System Shock, and Dishonored. Epic Mickey definitely has nothing for you. Which is especially disappointing considering one of those series was created by the director of Epic Mickey. It's a shame things had to end this way. Although, I'm glad I finally closed this chapter of my life. Every time I looked at my Wii Remote, I saw Oswald. I'd look on the side of my Wii, and those stickers would still be there. It was only a matter of time until I went back to investigate, and these were my unfortunate findings. As for Oswald, he hasn't appeared prominently in a Disney feature since Epic Mickey 2. I remember seeing him briefly in that phenomenal Mickey Mouse short that played before Frozen, but that was five years ago, and that was in a cartoon that was very much centered on Mickey Mouse. Yet again, Oswald lives in Mickey's shadow. It's nice that Disney owns him again, but we aren't too far off from Oswald ending up in the public domain, much like Steamboat Willie. In fact, some of Oswald's shorts are already in the public domain. So, we've ended up right where we began. Both the effort that went into developing Epic Mickey and reacquiring Oswald from Universal seems to have been in vain, as Disney now has no idea what to do with him or how to honor his legacy. Seems like he'll be abandoned by Disney once again, floating in limbo for a long time. Epic Mickey! Now for the Nintendo Wii console! Buy it or you don't have it! You're a strange animal, that's what I know. Whew, thanks for watching this doozy of a video. It took me a long time to write this one, and an even longer time to consider what I actually thought of this series, but hey, it's out, and I hope you liked it. So this video was brought to you by LastLife.net a community that my friends and I created for thoughtful video game discussion. The forums are open to anyone and you can talk with people about whatever you want. You want to talk about video games? Fine. You want to talk about movies? You can do that too. Music? Any form of art? You can do that. If you want to talk about the Canadian dollar and why it, and why it might be plummeting, I, I mean you could do that too if you wanted. But most of all, I hope you check out some of my friends' videos, and you can discuss their videos on the forums, and they might even show up. It's just a fun community that I thought would bring everyone together, and I hope you find a few new favorite creators this way. So, lastlife.net. I'll be putting the intro bumper at the beginning of my videos until the end of time, I guess. Just as a reminder that Last Life is a thing that exists, and I enjoy being a part of it, very much so. As always, this video was brought to you by my patrons, and they're scrolling on the screen right now. And I want to extend a heartfelt thanks to all of you once again, because without you, I wouldn't be able to make these videos as often as I do. Anyway, that's all I have to say. See you guys in the next video.